So I wanted to introduce Nancy Thornberry, who I've known for a long time. We worked together at Merck. Uh, she was a career uh, research scientist at Merck, and probably her biggest claim to fame was she was a, she and her chemistry partner, Ann Weber, led the team that uh, invented Genuvia, which is, was at the time the most successful drug in Merck's history, and also won the pre-Gallienne in 2007. Uh, Nancy's had a fantastic career, and she's done a number of things in the biopharmaceutical industry. And post-Merck, she's made two um, huge transitions. One is from big pharma to the world of startup biotech, and from head of large research organizations to a CEO, and she's now the CEO of Calliope. So great pleasure that I turn the podium over to Nancy. Thank you so much, Mike. Great. Well, we're closing it off here today and um, on an incredibly exciting topic, I think you'll agree, um, uh, on the gut microbiome. Uh, Calliope is actually not a microbiome company. We're focusing on the gut-brain axis, uh, but obviously the microbiome is an integral part of that, and so it is a field I follow closely. Um, but very excited today to have just some um, four extraordinary uh, panelists who are really leading the field in the microbiome area. Um, and so I think you'll agree this is a tremendously exciting uh, new area of science. There's been really an exponential increase in research in the microbiome and investment um, over the last decade or so that has really increased our understanding. Um, and I think it's clear now that the gut microbiome plays an integral role in a variety of different aspects of physiology with links to disease. Um, there's been a, a very large investment in microbiome uh, research in biotech. I would say that pharma is, has been a little more tentative, and there are certainly pharma companies that have embraced the area, but others are adopting a bit of a more wait and see attitude. And so I think appropriate to um, the um, Gallium Foundation and the mission, we're really going to focus today on the subject of translation. Like, what are the challenges in the field, and what are the things that are really barriers to taking this field to the next level in terms of human health? And so that will be the main focus. As you'll note, we actually don't have anyone from pharma on the panel, and I'm sure there are pharma people out there, so we're going to be looking for a very interactive session uh, where we get your thoughts on kind of what good looks like to you in terms of translation in this area. But we're going to start by... First, of course, um, the panelists introducing themselves um, and also level setting you in terms of what we know today um, about the microbiome and links to physiology and disease. Then we'll move quickly into the discussion of challenges um, in translation. Uh, so with that, I'll ask each of the panelists to just briefly in two or three um, sentences describe who they are, where they work, and what they do at a very high level. I'm Bernard Ollier. I'm the CEO of Vedanta Biosciences. We're a Cambridge-based company that's developing drugs that have as their active ingredient live consortia of bacteria. I'm Michael Fishback. I'm uh, I, an associate professor of bioengineering at Stanford, and my lab is interested in the microbiome. And our um, I was originally trained as a chemist, so our angle is that we're interested in the chemistry of the microbiome. I'm Dan Littman. I'm a uh, professor at NYU School of Medicine, right next door here. Our lab's actually in the other Alexandria building. Uh, I'm also associated with Vedanta Biosciences, which seems to have uh, had precedence uh, over my professorship. Uh, maybe appropriate today. Uh, and uh, we are, uh, my lab works on the immune system and uh, in particular how the immune system is influenced by the microbiota and uh, trying to decipher the signals uh, to the, in both directions to and from microbiota and the immune system. Uh, and I'm Sarkis Mazmanian, a professor at Caltech, I'm a microbiologist by training, but really interested in the interactions between the gut microbiome and the immune system, as well as the nervous system. Recently, been interested in the in the gut brain connection, and I've founded uh, two companies now: one in the immunology space, and one in the neuroscience space with assets that include small molecules as well as live bacteria. Great, thank you so much. And so Sarkis has again, in terms of level set in the audience, what do we know today? 
Uh, Sarkis has very kindly agreed to give us a very brief, high-level overview of, um, of what we know. Yes, thanks, Nancy, and then also to the organizers. Um, and we thought, we, as a panel, we would just, um, uh, just give you an overview, as Nancy said, to make sure that everyone has the, the, the information on the microbiome. It's an emerging field and, and very rapidly moving, and so we want to make sure that, um, the question, that what we will present to you uh, elicits uh, questions uh, that are on the cutting edge. And so just, again, really briefly, uh, we're all covered uh, by microbes outside and in. About 100 uh, trillion microbes live inside of us. Uh, that means there are more microbes in you than there are human cells. It's kind of appropriate that this session is right after the gene editing session or the, or the gene therapy session, um, because uh, we talk a lot about genomes and how, how do you how do you um, uh, interrogate the genome as well as as well as manipulate the genome. Uh, many people have proposed the microbiome is our second genome, and, and some of the evidence for that is that there's 150 times as many gene families in our microbiome as there is in our own genome, and these you know gene products are contributing to our biology. Biology, and I'll mention at least one, one aspect of that. Um, and inherently, our microbiome is much more tractable in terms of manipulation than the genome is, and so hopefully that uh, sparks some, some, at the very minimum, curiosity in, in, uh, in the field. Um, and of course, there's really a, a divergence of microbes uh, across the, the human ecosystem, uh, at very minimum 10,000 different species of bacteria, many hundreds, thousands of more strains, but each of us have a, have a unique fingerprint um, of our microbiomes. So again, really, you know, not to do the, the field a, a disservice, but, then, um, but just to give you some examples of, of the advances and the types of advances that have been made over the past few years. Um, I just uh, copied this from, from Google, but th we've identified as a field particular microbes that have very specific uh, responses in terms of augmenting the immune system. So think very differently than infectious agents where the immune system is fighting to control or remove a, a, a pathogen. These are organisms that engage the immune system and in many ways augment the immune system. Um, and just running through, so segmented filamentous ba bacteria, SFB, this is what, what Dan's worked on for many years. Um, uh, stimulates the, the uh, proliferation and, in fact, the differentiation of a particular cell type called Th17 cells, which are important in a variety of different autoimmune diseases. And so think about this, at least in mice, that there are entire cell types that don't exist unless a microbe educates the immune system to differentiate that cell type. And so again, really profound effects on, on, on our physiology. An organism that my laboratory has worked on, Bacteria fragilis, where we've identified specific molecules that induce anti-inflammatory responses, and, and similar to um, uh, what Bernat's company uh, has worked on in these Clostridium species that you see here. Um, that are organisms that induce these regulatory T cells. So these are now anti-inflammatory T cells. So think about autoimmune diseases and other allergic inflammatory diseases where um, uh, particular microbes can, can, have, uh, can have beneficial effects. And then, again, you know, inflammation is good when you're trying to control an infection or cancer. It's bad when it's, un you know, when it's rampant and it leads to a variety of different uh, immunologic disorders. And at least preclinically, with some, you know, uh, recent clinical evidence, it appears that the microbiome can modulate the immune system in a way that, that can impact a variety of different um, immunologic disorders. Um, same for metabolism, probably even, even as obvious as the effects of the immune system are the effects on metabolism, right? Because bacteria digest most of the, the food that we eat into small molecules that are then dispersed throughout um, uh, our bodies and reach all reaches uh, uh, on all corners of our bodies. And so, you know, several examples here. I think one that maybe I'll just highlight is the, is the one on top that may be hard to read is this example that, that you know, dietary products such as carnitine and choline can be transformed into trimethylamine, which is then converted into trimethylamine and oxide, which has been shown to induce atherosclerosis, um, and again, both preclinical as well as clinical settings. And so think of small molecules and metabolism that affect our bodies, and of course, you know, obesity and type 2 diabetes have been strongly linked to the microbiome. And, you know, I have to, to maybe take a, a minute to say there's a lot of associated, association studies that come from the type of research that happens in the microbiome. When you sequence people's gut bacteria, you can get an association between a disease population healthy population or different geographies, different diets, what have you. Um, I think perhaps that's also a theme for the panel is to move beyond some of these associations into, into, into at least, you know, contributions, maybe causation. Uh, but at least in, in obesity, it appears to be that there, there's a, a, certainly a contributing factor of the gut microbiome to, to, uh, to disease. And of course, you know, maybe, you know, one of the, the more burgeoning areas is this gut-brain connection. So there are many conduits that, that connect the gut to the brain, whether they be small molecules or neurotransmitters that we produce under the direction of, of microbes. Uh, circulating immune cells that, that can reach a central nervous system, obviously the vagus nerve, which connects the enteric nervous system to the central nervous system, um, 
and we now know, at least again, you know, from, from association studies, that the microbiome of neurological conditions is different than that of the general population. And I listed, you know, several examples here, but really a new area uh, uh, of research. And one that could be really exciting, right? So many people in this room have tried to get drugs across the, the blood-brain barrier, and so maybe the, the microbes can figure out ways to provide us with conduits to do that. Um, maybe the, the newest kid on the block is immuno-oncology, right? and so just really a, 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 a tremendous amount of work that's come out just in the past two or three years showing that a person's microbiome may impact or may likely impact their, their response to a checkpoint inhibitor, and so this is just one example uh, showing that uh, people who were non-responders um, to checkpoint inhibitors, if you take their gut microbiomes and put them into mouse models of various different uh, uh, cancers, that those mice are now non-responders as well. If you take the microbiome from a responding patient, put that into microbiome, then that, that mouse, the same genetically, uh, 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 the same genetically background mouse will now respond. And so, there, you know, people have now started trying to understand what are the particular organisms that are meeting this effect. Can you turn a non-responding patient into a responder just by administering a bacteria, maybe, maybe even changing the microbiome with, with other uh, modalities that include small molecules? Um, and I think probably the biggest win, if you will, or the success story in the microbiome is, is an old one. It's, it's fecal transplants, which have been going on for decades. Uh, uh, and this is uh, largely for an indication uh, uh, called reoccurring C. Diff C uh, Clostridium difficile infections, which, are which is an organism that lives in about 30% of the population but can really cause a very serious gastrointestinal issue if it overtakes the, the microbiome. And fecal transplants are incredibly um, successful in treating uh, reoccurring clostridium difficile infection. I just pulled one example of this. Here's a meta-analysis that looked across 11 uh, studies and showed almost 90 percent success rate, so durable um, effic efficacy in curing uh, 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 reoccurring C. diff infections just with a single uh, fecal transplant. And so again, you know, we talk about FDA-approved drugs and what, you know, percentage of those work in, in populations. Again, you know, we have a, a natural therapy here, if you will, that works in about 90 percent of its patient population. And then just finally, you know, what is the investment, as, as Nancy already touched upon, in, in this space? And I think it's, it's small but growing. Um, and just the example uh, uh, over the years. Uh, of, of um, investments in uh, mostly in therapeutics, but also in diagnostics and, and, and other areas as well. But I think the best is yet to come. Um, and here are just some of the examples of the partnerships that have already been formed um, in this space. Uh, and one that's missing here, I think the slide is outdated, is there was a recent acquisition um, by Faring Pharmaceuticals of a company called Rebiotics that's developing fecal transplants for C. diff infection. So again, more and more engagement with, uh, with the pharma community and uh, the growing biotech industry. Great. Thank you so much, Sarkis. That was terrific. So you alluded to the fact that in terms of link to disease, um, in many cases a causal relationship has not been established. Um, so I'm just curious very briefly from each of your perspectives, where do you think there has been, there's compelling evidence of a causal relationship and some mechanistic information in terms of disease? Um, Actually, I, th I think the last slide from, from Sarkis kind of tells half the story. Um, the, the half that, that relates to IBD, the other half is C. difficile. I think these are, these are the two areas where and obviously in IBD you have pharma interest and in infectious disease you don't have any pharma interest. But, but that's why I'm saying it does have the story. I think th these are the two indications where there's been more data accumulating uh, of control, randomized control studies of fecal transplantation as a first generation modality showing um, rates of efficacy superior or comparable to standard of care. In C. difficile, uh, the academic trials have shown ranges of efficacy of 80 to 90 percent compared to roughly 30 percent for standard care vancomycin for infectious um, relapsing disease. The, the industry trials have been less successful, but still, um, you know, there, there's been one failure, but there's also been another study that's shown 60 to 7 percent efficacy. Uh, which is not as impressive as the academic studies, but still better than standard care. And then in IBD, you have now three or four randomized control studies, randomized placebo control studies, showing remission and response rates on the order of 25%, which may not sound that great, but that's what you get for anti-TNFs. Uh, so 
if you talk to uh, gastroenterologists, they take this data seriously. That, that is uh, the type of effect that you expect from a drug. I think these are, these just happen to be the two areas that have, have gotten more attention. Um, but there's going to be a lot more areas that, that, uh, that this is going to be relevant to, and hopefully you guys can touch on some of them. Michael? Great. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dodge your question about where there is good evidence for causality since, uh, since I think that, that's, that, that the, the number of diseases where that's been proven is small, and instead say that I think there's a lot of therapeutic opportunity even in diseases that are not caused by the microbiome. An example of that would be uh, in liver disease where there is no way that I know of to alter the composition of the bile acid pool other than to let it be worked over by bacteria in the gut. Uh, who turn it into a, a widely varying cocktail of some 70-odd different bile acids at different ratios in one person or another, determined probably almost exclusively by which bacteria are there. And now that we know, given uh, some of the drugs that are in clinical trials for NASH, how much of an impact one can have by altering the size of the bile acid pool, I think that that's a vista for microbiome therapies there, even though the microbiome did not cause NASH it may be a great way to, to uh, solve the problem. And the same could be said for even for response to immunotherapy, where certainly the microbiome was not the cause of, of the cancer, um, but it can be used to help potentiate the response to, the, to another drug. And, and so I think that uh, even if that were the only contribution of the microbiome to oncology, it would be a large one. Um, I really don't have that much to add, but, you know, clearly, uh, Causality is something that's been uh, eluding us, um, and uh, uh, we have very good causality studies in, in the mouse. Uh, I think we'd all agree on that. Um, the question is whether that can really be translated uh, to mechanisms in human, uh, and uh, uh, in a few cases, such as uh, some of the experiments Sarkis has done and uh, some of the folks in the immuno-oncology field have done, the same kind of microbiota that uh, are found in associations in human uh, have a, a reasonable outcome as well in the mouse, uh, suggesting that there is a causality in the, in the human disease. Uh, but we are a long ways from any kind of mechanistic understanding, and that's what I'm going to keep pounding away at here. We need to really understand mechanism. We are a long ways in the basic science in terms of understanding what's going on, and I think we have to be careful not to, uh, not to be led so much by phenomenology and really try to put more resources into getting a mechanism that can then be used uh, for therapeutics. While well, tempted to dodge your question, Nancy, I'll maybe rephrase and, 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 and ask my own question of, of, of contribution, right, which I, which I already alluded to. Um, you know, it's, it, I'm of the opinion that there, you know, the microbiome may be causal in very few circumstances, right? And, so I, and I do agree that, that, you know, the fecal transplant uh, effects on, on C. diff are is sort of that, that shining example of where, you know, everything happens in the gut and you can control that. Um, and by just manipulating the microbiome, you can have therapeutic effects. I really think that most of the, the indications where the microbiome has been implicated have a genetic predisposition. The microbiome is one additional contributor to that. So think of this as like two-hit um, uh, uh, theory, right, where a, a person may be predisposed to a particular uh, disease but may have, I'm going to call it, for lack of a better term, the right microbiome. It doesn't manifest in disease, but if you have the wrong microbiome, you do, right? And there are examples of this, right? Some inflammatory bowel disease, so two of the... You know, there's tons of, you know, GWAS and now exome and full genome studies. Uh, and the two uh, most prominent risk factors are genes atg 6 l one and NOT2. And many of those polymorphisms are carried in healthy people, right, so that, 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 that don't manifest disease. Um, but a subset of, of those individuals whose microbiome has gone astray, if you will, you know, develop those diseases, right? So I think there, there are examples that, you know, a person may be predisposed but, you know, changes the microbiome and then compound that genetic predisposition. Great. So, uh, obviously, what's attractive about the area is the very broad array of physiology um, that the microbiome has been implicated in and the opportunity to potentially go after diseases of high unmet need in a fundamentally new way. So, it allows pharma, biotech to really think about different ways of targeting diseases that have otherwise been um, in extraordinarily difficult. So here we have represented um, expertise in neuroscience, immunology and inflammation, bugs as drugs, microbiome metabolites. So I'm just curious from each of your perspectives, 
what do you really see as the major barriers to kind of um, just taking your own field to the next level? And I think we, we probably know Dan's answer, more mechanistic studies, <laughs> but um, uh, let's start at Sarkis. Um, more mechanistic studies. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with that, right? Um, and and there's, it, it, that's a, it's, it's hard to argue with that because what mechanistic studies will do is they'll give you additional targets than, than what you start with, right? So once you really understand a, a process, you're going to identify cell types and receptors that you can then drug it with new modalities that don't include bacteria or, 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 or their products. But then to, to Nancy's point, um, at least in the, in the gut brain space, you know, like, I think I'm being repetitive here, but, but you know, I, I think there's an opportunity to access the brain through the gut, right? I mean, there are really a, a, a wealth of connections between our gut and our brains, and, and they include a variety of different, you know, modalities, uh, as I've already mentioned. And, you know, it's a much lower barrier to get drugs of pharmaceutical, uh, uh, pharmaceutical doses or pharmacological doses into, into the gut without having to, to deal with the blood-brain barrier. And then there's also this opportunity to have gut-restricted molecules, right? Molecules that remain in the gut um, and don't hit other targets throughout the body like all the drugs that are currently you know, being, being used for CNS disorders. I'm a big believer in gut-restricted molecules, the target <laughs> the gut-brain access. Yeah, I... Uh, I'm obviously biased, but I think that uh, accessing the immune system is a tremendous opportunity. And as we learn more about how uh, different bacteria signal to the immune system, uh, how different metabolites affect uh, different subsets of the immune system, uh, I think there will be tremendous opportunities for, uh, uh, for new therapeutics. Um, and uh, uh, certainly that's uh, from the point of view of uh, autoimmune diseases, inflammatory diseases, there's very good uh, uh, if there's very good associated, associative data, again, uh, as uh, Sarkis alluded to, in, uh, in IBD and Crohn's disease with particular dysbioses uh, that may actually have some drivers of the disease that function in conjunction with the uh, genetic predispositions. Uh, but uh, I, I think that is something that is accessible, but we're going to need better animal models, um, and uh, we're going to have to, uh, to work... Uh, uh, with uh, uh, with the uh, the kinds of communities that uh, that are best representative of the kinds of uh, uh, of uh, the kinds of processes that are going on in the human disease, and probably Michael will tell you some uh, something about that of construction of uh, communities that might be in one way or another representative of particular diseases, but I think what we need to basically match uh, the our knowledge of uh, of bacteriology with our uh, ability to, to look at responses of the immune system, of particular, t uh, uh, particular cells in the immune system. Great. I'll, I'll make two points. One is that, um, very quickly on the topic of the chemistry of the microbiome, I don't think that it's its own disease area or application. I think that uh, it may help to explain the effects of the microbiome on the immune system, like Dan studies, or the effects of the microbiome on behavior and cognition and, and other uh, um, sort of diseases of the brain, like Sarkis studies. I vote with my feet because I'm working with them on those topics, but I think more broadly that, uh, that the, the mediators, the molecular mediators of microbiome host interactions are likely to be, in many cases, diffusible or cell-associated small molecules. So I think that, that there's going to be a lot of mechanistic potential in exploring those further. Uh, the second point is about, is sort of more broad than that, which is that I think that there is a great, tremendous need um, for better reductionist systems to study the microbiome. I think that, you know, is, there couldn't be a starker contrast between the format of the previous session where, where most of the work was on studying monogenic diseases where we know exactly what's wrong with the patient. They're missing a gene. We, we know that if we restore the gene that it will cure the disease. That there couldn't be anything further from where my field is than that. We are working in a system in the gut you might have you know, 600 to 800 different strains that differ from one person to the next that make up the gut, and each of these is an organism that has 4,000 genes in its genome, and this is a stunningly complex system, and it's been very difficult for us, people who have mechanistic sensibilities, and I think all of us up here do, to do the kind of work that makes sense to all of you, where you like to make one change and then see exactly what happens so that you can tinker and make a slightly different change the next time and see something better happen, and that's how you make a drug. And so I think that once we come up with better uh, defined 
systems that lend themselves to reductionist manipulation that we're going to be able to speak the same language as you um, uh, in, in a way that I think should advance the, the joint efforts of academia and industry in this area. Yeah, I actually have a follow-on to that because it strikes me that um, when I first got uh, into this area three years ago with Caliope, um, that I found that the people who work on enteroendocrine cells aren't really talking to the people who work on the enteric nervous system, don't really talk to the people working on the microbiome, don't talk to the people working on the vagus, and so forth and so on. So to the extent that this is a highly integrated system with lots of communication, um, just uh, I've been a little frustrated by that and wondering how we can really get the right people in the room to really think about this in a more systems biology way. And do you yeah. think that that's important uh, to actually advancing the field. Yeah, I think it's very important. I'll add one more thing, and I don't want to. I, I want to uh, hear Bernard's thoughts too. But that, um, you know, as a if you view the microbiome area as a set of techniques, that also hasn't pervaded very far. That the, the set of techniques tends to be locked up inside of people's labs who do microbiome work, uh, as opposed to things like single cell RNA sequencing and CRISPR, which are easy enough to use and easy enough to interpret that tons of people use them. So I wonder what would happen if we made it much easier to measure and manipulate the microbiome in a way that uh, we could democratize so that people could make easy changes that, that are interpretable, uh, whether that would um, make it easier again to, to bring people from all over the, the field of biology, academia, and industry in, into working on the microbiome. So I'll have some comments on challenges that are specific to to medicines based on live bacteria, which is what we do. Uh, and and uh, the point that Michael made on reductionism and mechanisms is a good segue uh, to, to three, three challenges that, that I want to uh, highlight. Uh, the, the first one is if instead of uh, going reductionistic and towards mechanisms, you take the other approach of trying to figure out how to assemble microbial communities that do what a healthy microbial community does in a healthy individual, then w which is what we're trying to do. Uh, we have a challenge as a field, um, a basic challenge, which I think is we don't know yet what are the basic rules that govern how ecosystems assemble and form together. A lot of the techniques that we use today are descriptive techniques that help us identify statistical differences in large data sets. But those differences don't tell you anything about how to create from scratch a community of bacteria that work well. Uh, and, and I think we need to come up with a better understanding of how uh, ecosystems come together to then be able to do truly rational design. A lot of what we do now is brute force and, and empiric. A second challenge that we have relates to manufacturing. And, and uh, the comments that Dr. Marx made in the gene therapy session resonated for us. Uh, we, we've had to, for the first time in this field, figure out how to manufacture GMP grade bacterial consortia in a lyophilized form that we could give to patients. And so we found that the diversity of bacteria that we have to deal with is a challenge. Each of them have different morphologies, different membranes. So you have to figure out different growth conditions, lyophilization conditions. They're strict anaerobes. They die if you expose them to oxygen. So you have to think of your manufacturing process and each of the unit operations in different ways. Um, and our first products are, are if, you, if you look at the cost of goods, it looks terrible, very high. Uh, so if we if we hope that one day what we do will benefit more than developed countries, then we need to also uh, accomplish a couple of orders of magnitude of savings or lower costs of manufacturing. And some of the biggest, uh, some of the areas where the biggest impact could be had are uh, developing world conditions. I actually think malnutrition deaths, uh, which is the number one cause of death in the world today, uh, is uh, are. Uh, is a problem that could be addressed with microbiome approaches, but only if we really bring the costs way down. And then a third challenge that we've uh, had to work with is, relates to making sense of clinical information. We've, uh, for the first time, put our drug modality of defined consortium to the clinic and had to figure out how do we measure what the drug does? How do we measure the PK and the PD of a microbiome drug? Uh, and what that means to us is how do you measure the abundance, durability, and robustness of the colonization of bugs and the changes that they bring about in the surrounding community. And one challenge here is that 
If you really want to make sure that what you're measuring is what you gave, the exogenous drug and not the endogenous bacteria that the person already had, which may look very similar to the ones that you gave, you need very good reference databases of bacterial genomes. So we actually had to create internally a database of more than um, 3,000 genomes of, of different bacteria that we had to sequence from humans across the world to be able to say with precision that the bacteria that we were measuring in the stool of patients after dosing them were actually the ones that we gave and not the ones that the people already had. Wow. Um, so I'm going to just pause here a minute, see if there are questions from the audience and or comments in terms of... I have a yeah. You just commented on cost of goods. Bacteria work pretty cheaply. I, I was wondering where you, where 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 your costs come from, um, and and in terms of scaling, obviously the, the costs would be very low as you scale. So just just curious. So keep in mind that this is this is cost of of phase one of scaling up for the first time a process and then dividing that cost over the number of pills that you make. If we had a scale up process of twenty thousand liters, we hope that we could bring those costs way down. So, that, so that's part of the point that I was making. Uh, one of the components of the cost is the, just the sheer number of active ingredients that we have in the drug. Our drugs have our consortium bacteria. They can have 10, 15, 20 different bacteria. Each bacteria is a different active ingredient which has to be produced separately and quality controlled separately. So every test that you make on that bacteria for purity, for identity, for potency, you're gonna have to do n times for the number of bacteria that you have on your uh, on your product. So that's going to basically linearly scale the cost of the uh, of all the release uh, material testing costs that you have associated with the product. And that's a very high component for us right now. Also, it means that you have to develop n processes to make your product. You don't have one process. You have as many processes as different bacteria you're trying to make. And they may have different growth conditions, different lyophilization conditions, etc. Uh, when we figure this out and we bring it way down, you're right, it's bacteria. They grow fast. We should be able to bring it down. So I think the problem has a solution. We just need time and technology development. Hi. I'm Bruce Zetter from Boston Children's Hospital. I'm wondering how our microbiome changes with age. If we had a baseline, how often would we have to get it? And related to that, what's being done with microbiome work in the pediatric community. Who wants to take that? Uh, I'll handle the first one. So, yeah, so your microbiome does change with age, right, in what is becoming somewhat more predictable as we get larger data sets. Um, and the age is not just old age, but then but young age as well, right? And so, we're, again, we're, we're inheriting our microbiomes from our mothers, right? There's actually a paper that just came out today showing that, that, that there's a transgenerational effect. So, again, just like we inherit our genes, we inherit our microbiomes. But then that microbiome does assemble over the first three years of life to what looks like a, an adult microbiome. Then you generally maintain that microbiome, unless there's a catastrophic event, right? You know, some gastroenteritis or, 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 or an illness. Then you generally maintain that microbiome but then as you get into your 60s and 70s, the microbiome does change, right? Um, but again, getting back to this association is we don't know what those changes practically mean. What, what article, where is that one? It was just published in science, the current issue of science. And there is, of course, uh, uh, tremendous disturbance of microbiota with malnutrition that uh, Jeff Gordon and others have, uh, uh, have uh, done a lot of elegant work on, which actually can persist into the the transition to a uh, to a later microbiome, uh, and that's why it's so difficult to treat those uh, those children as they go into adolescence. One, one more comment on 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 children. A lot of the clinical work has been done in adults because disproportionately C. difficile infections affect adults, and most of the work's been done there. Uh, there's been very few studies in uh, in children. The first the first fecal transplantation studies in children are just being done right now. That being said, I think microbiome approaches have big potential for, uh, for pediatric populations because everything we've seen to this point um, with the clinical studies to date is that this is a fairly safe modality, modality um, uh, uh, as far as the studies to date tell, you know, cross, cross fingers. And so being able to go into children with drugs that you, you have a general expectation may be safer than the average new chemical entity, I think could make uh, pediatric research potentially a little bit easier. 
There's a question back here. Sorry, right here, sir. New Jersey Medical School. I'm an epidemiologist. And in thinking of multifactorial disease, I suspect you're going to need some large cohort studies in terms of causality. Uh, in those terms, do you think we know enough yet how to incorporate a uh, collection of specimens from the microbiome to incorporate in those types of long-term cohort studies where we'd store them away, or do you think that's premature? I think it depends on the disease because it's already being done in, in several uh, uh, arenas. So inflammatory bowel disease was mentioned. Uh, uh, type two, or sorry, type one diabetes uh, has also. Um, there's a very very large cohort studies um, that have shown you know particular organisms that, that track with disease. So again, it just depends on on where that particular field is or that indication is, and have they you know done the the, the large studies. In part, I ask because some of those same studies has shown some significant transitions in the microbiome under various environmental and other challenges. And so if you do a one-time collection, imputing from that single microbiome collection may be erroneous. And that's why I'm wondering where you see some of the variation. It's the same as, you know, measuring your blood sugar, right? It, you know, it's, it's going to fluctuate throughout, throughout the day. And, and we know the microbiome does change very rapidly as well, right? And so, again, you know, you have those lo longitudinal studies that will give you the trajectory of the microbiome. But, you know, if you want this in a disease indication, it has to be, you know, it, you know, it can't be disease of aging, right? Because, it, you know, that's a 50-year study. But that's why I think, you know, type 1 diabetes may you know, make sense. Uh, um, and maybe even asthma may, may make sense as well. Hi, um, I'm in Salem. Uh, I'm a neurosurgeon. And I had a question about: um, Are there studies being done that would show that uh, how microbiome uh, affects the bioavailability of drugs and manipulating microbiome to improve the bioavailability of drugs? Since, as physicians, we give patients, you know, one size fits all medications, and the bioavailability actually varies one day to the other. I'm going to volunteer Michael to answer. Yeah, that's a good question. There certainly are. Uh, there are several groups working on this, and a couple of examples that have been shown, um, that have been published, showing that a, a drug is metabolized directly by the microbiome. Um, so some, in some cases, that activates the drug, and in other cases, it inactivates the drug, and so, or and, and in still other cases, forms a toxic metabolite. So, for, for sure, people are looking into this, and uh, based on work that's unpublished and kind of broadly emanating through the field, it seems like that's going to be a broader paradigm than we had realized before. So I would expect to see more of that coming down the pike in the next couple of years. And if I can just add to that, it, you know, uh, there are examples of metabolism of drugs by the microbiome, but there's, you know, also this, uh, the bioavailability of drugs that I, that I think there's examples of. So in Parkinson's patients, you know, there, there are absorption issues with, with, with levodopa. Right, but if you can fix the constipation and some of the, the uh, transit issues that, that Parkinson's patients have, you get more absorption of, uh, of, of levodopa. So I think you can get get more use out of existing drugs by changing the physiology around that drug. I'd add that the other face of that, which is a a, a vista that I don't think there's much activity in, is that um, drugs don't look too different to the bugs than do nutrients from the diet, and that there's a um, that there are, there's evidence in the literature that uh, that nutrient bioavailability, meaning you and I eat the same meal but don't get the same nutrients in our bloodstream based presumably on differences in which bugs are in our gut, could be an interesting place to look. And uh, given that uh, we'd like to think more about disease prevention uh, than cure, um, that this is, uh, you know, should be low-hanging fruit for optimizing the extraction of nutrients from diet. Do you actually see work in this area having an impact on how we use antibiotics? I'll, I'll jump in with a, an answer that others might disagree with. I think antibiotics are exceedingly important and we can't do without them. And there's been a lot of, especially from this field, there's, there's been a lot of concern um, put forward about the overuse of antibiotics. No doubt that's a problem and no doubt it decreases the lifetime of antibiotics in the, in the clinic and that's a terrible thing. But my guess is that um, rather than uh, uh, going to the extreme to try to avoid antibiotic courses in kids, uh, very likely we'll come to a place where we can recolonize people after they take a course of antibiotics to avoid what might be harmful effects of 
of wiping the you know the garden clean and then not replanting any seeds. Yeah, I think as as we have a better understanding of what is the the core microbiome, and there's a lot of work going on on that to try to to uh, to really uh, come to some consensus as what that might be. It will become possible to reconstitute the basic metabolic pathways that might be impacted by certain kinds of antibiotics, and. Uh, uh, I, I agree with Michael. I think that that's where uh, the future of antibiotics use is likely to be. And I think we can be smarter, smarter about antibiotics as well, right? And so develop antibiotics that are designer, if you will, and, and target specific species and specific strains of bacteria that we know are, are, are the smoking gun in a particular <coughs> disease and that don't have collateral damage on the rest of the microbiome. And there are, there's work going on in that, in that space with both chemicals as well as phage. Yeah, I, th I think that the work in the microbiome field is shining a light on the on the consequences of, of antibiotic use, and in some cases you you will see doctors doing th something about it, and some others they can't. Um, but in general, knowing that antibiotics as a class are not universally safe, and that there are consequences to the use of antibiotics, it's it's just good, especially for for informing unnecessary use. But then, as Michael said, there's some applications where just the clinical practice is not going to change. And I think a good example is the, the one that um, Sark has introduced uh, at the beginning of cancer immunotherapy. There's some very recent data showing that uh, courses of antibiotics before starting checkpoint inhibitor treatment uh, blunt the response or, or are associated, I don't want to attribute causality, are, are associated with lower response. It, it may or may not be causal. Um, but when we've talked to clinicians, uh, oncologists, uh, about this, um, they don't say, oh, we would stop giving antibiotics. If, if, the, if the cancer patients develop an infection, they will be treated with the antibiotic, and it, and it has to be done, right? So then, in, in those situations, we, we may be exactly in the scenario that Michael described, where you know they may have a consequence, but you go, by and try, you go back and try to fix the mess after the antibiotic, rather than not using the antibiotic to begin with. Question there. Uh, this is another sort of causal question, maybe just a thought question. We talk a lot about how the microbiome is affecting human physiology. Is there evidence for the other way around um, natural selection to favor certain particular microbiomes? For example, is there a variant associated with C. diff infection? I would say there's been less work in that area. Uh, there are quite a few studies, but I'm not sure that we have a, a terribly good understanding yet. And uh, there are examples that I'm sure Sarkis can probably cite to you, being a, a true microbiologist who knows what kind of requirements uh, particular classes of bacteria have. Uh, but there's no question that uh, if you interfere with particular uh, branches of the immune system, for example, you are going to change uh, the composition of the, of the microbiota, um, and for a, a variety of different reasons. Um, uh, but again, I, you know, I'm not sure I can cite specific examples. My distillation of, and, and again, this, this is not, I don't mean to speak for everybody, but my own view of what the data show is that the dominant effect, uh, there are the two dominant effects on the composition of everybody's microbiome are your diet and the founder effect, whoever got there first. And everything else is minor compared to that. There are rare human genetic variants that will uh, favor the, the blooming of a few rare taxa, but these are side effects off in the corner. The uh, uh, diet and the founder effects swamp all that. So the, the one, uh, follow, uh, so the, the, the one uh, possible counter example are these antimicrobial peptides. Um, I don't know if you guys come out and know Laura Hooper did some work on that. Variants in mice at least cause, potentially cause IVD. Somebody want to take that one? There are, there are so I'm trying to remember. There are some defense in mutations that can, uh, that can be associated, right? But I'm not sure if in human that's been seen, right? So, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. But is is your but, question whether antimicrobial peptides are some somehow an evolutionary process? I'm trying to tie that to initial question. I'm sure I understood. Uh, Well, for like what Sarkis was saying at the beginning, is certainly the, the genetics can also affect the composition of the microbiome. Uh, and uh, 
for example, if there are uh, if there are uh, uh, defects in autophagy uh, in uh, in particular cells in the gut, uh, that can feed back and uh, and affect the the overall composition uh, of the microbiome. And certainly, as you were mentioning, defensins, uh, defense a, a lack of a particular kind of defensin will uh, change the balance of the the types of microbes. Uh, that are present in the gut, and that could lead to a dysbiosis. Yeah, but, so, but, but again, all, all the, the most of the data don't uh, argue in favor of this this natural selection for a particular microbiome that, that that's based on genetics. Right? Uh, there's a lot more work that needs to be done, right? Because I mean, what are we talking about here? We're talking about you know a, a, a population of, of humans all with a you know a genetic landscape that's different from each other, and so you know where are the nodes or where where are the the particular you know pressure points that would then impact the microbiome? And, and you can imagine these are not trivial questions to answer, right? But if you think about what affects the composition of the microbiome. Right, at least in terms of counting species, I agree with Michael. It's 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 diet and it's founder effect. Right, and there's there's just a lot of evidence to support that. So I think we've heard um, from all of you that a large there's there's a long way there's a large amount of work that needs to be done. So the question is, you know, how to really move this very promising field forward as quickly as possible? How can pharma be a partner in that? You know, are there other um, large initiatives such as the Human Microbiome Project that could be helpful in advancing the field on the data science side? I mean, what is really needed to move this field forward as quickly as possible? I'll jump in and say, because I know that Dan's going to talk about mechanistic studies, which I, which I support 100 percent, it would have been my first answer. I'll say that the answer here is the same as it was for the last session, which is technology development. Uh, that I think we are, we're not getting the most out of our studies, and, and therapeutically, we're not getting the most out of the modality. Right now, the, the, um, even though I'm, I'm in awe of the amazing things that Vedanta and other companies in this space are doing, I think that the microbiome as a, um, as a modality is, is extraordinary in its ability to, you know, among other things, produce a, every time you eat a pool of tens of millimolar worth of molecules uh, that, that if we had control over the entire microbiome, we could control that pool. It probably carries out, I would argue, you know, at least tens of different potent immune modulatory processes all the time. Um, and if we had control over that, that would be extraordinary. And imagine with one therapeutic maneuver, just replacing somebody's microbiome, you could control a ton of biology if we understood it better, and especially if we knew how to build it. So I think that technology development, especially towards being able to reconstruct a microbiome from scratch in a way that is completely defined and can be taken apart in a completely reductionist way, um, uh, is, is a high priority. And do you see that? I, yeah, I see that imminently. happening imminently. Yeah, I, I want to catch on that and, and, and expand on this. The, the need to be able to build from scratch. I'm, I'm an engineer and I come with a, with a, with a bias. The, the big contributions to the microbiome field have not been made by engineers, have been made by microbiologists and immunologists. Um, but I think the field is now getting at a point where there's enough substrate of, of understanding around uh, immune uh, mechanisms, uh, microbiological interactions, that engineers can start coming in and applying mathematical modeling to build from scratch as opposed to just taking descriptive tools and extracting statistically significant patterns and trying to attribute that to some sort of causality. And so my, my answer is I think that there's a huge potential that is vastly underappreciated in the field right now for using mathematical modeling t techniques to be able to predict how groups of bacteria are going are gonna to work together. And this may be the only way we can do truly rational drug discovery with rational um, with, with groups of organisms because we have a basic combinatorial problem, which is if you find a hundred bacteria that are active on a, on a potency assay and you want to combine them to, to create a potent drug, you have two to the hundred minus one combinations that you could try, which you cannot do in vivo, you cannot do it even do in vitro, so you need to come up with ways to sh shrink the experimental space down to just a few things that are worth testing and spending money on. And the only way we're going to get there is with computational tools. <clears throat> I, I agree about comput computation, and I think probably artificial intelligence in the future, as there is an accumulation of data from individuals with different conditions, uh, I don't understand artificial intelligence at all, <laughs> but uh, I expect that there are going to be means of really extracting 
uh, important information about biosynthetic pathways, for example, uh, that are critical in uh, particular kinds of diseases. Um, I think uh, one area that, uh, uh, that really requires much more uh, investment in uh, is the area of metabolites. And uh, we have tremendous genomic tools that have come along in the, in the last few years. Uh, I know Michael and I, and, and I think uh, uh, Sarkis were at a meeting at the NIH a few years ago talking about having more references for uh, uh, reference metabolites so we can really assign uh, metabolites from, uh, uh, from the, the data that uh, uh, we have access to. And uh, we still have only a fraction of metabolites that we know. Uh, as well as uh, being able to pinpoint the biosynthetic pathways uh, that can lead to generation of that metabolite. And, you know, the kinds of synthetic biology approaches that Michael and others are doing will benefit enormously, obviously, once we, once we have a uh, better understanding of these. So I think that's an area where there can be more investment. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm quite bullish of, of what will happen over the next few years in, in terms of identifying um, how particular genetic changes in the microbiome may predispose to a disease, right? Because I think what we're seeing now is a, is a shift from counting bacteria to, to looking at their genomes, right? Because now the economics of doing, of doing metagenomics, which is surveying the entire gene repertoire of the microbiome as opposed to one gene that, that tells you a descriptor about the organism, is now available. And I think we're going to see more and more of these metagenomic studies. And so just to, again, orient everybody is, you know, most of the field has really been driven by, by sequencing a particular gene that's carrying all bacteria. Here, the, the ribosomal RNA gene. And so, um, and what does that mean? So it means that you know the genus and species of the organism, so you may know my first and last name, but it doesn't tell you my personality, right? It doesn't tell you anything else about what I'm doing. It doesn't tell you about all the other genes on the genome. But now that we have that technology in place, what, we, what we're seeing is, A, there's a lot more homogeneity among the metagenome than there is uh, among, you know, bacterial species. Yes, we are different in terms of bacterial species, but in terms of biological functions, there, there's a lot of conservation. So now you can start asking questions of, so what's different? different in terms of gene content or gene variant between a disease population and a healthy population. This sounds much more traditional to me uh, in terms of identifying genes. And if you can identify, uh, identifying, you know, you know, contributions to the disease, and if you can identify a gene variant, the existence or presence of a gene or, or a difference in, in a particular function within a gene, now you can drug that microbial target, right? And it's a bacterial enzyme or a bacterial molecule that you're targeting, likely not conserved in mammals or metazoans. And so you'll, you'll have very, uh, you'll, you're unlikely to have off-target effects. And there's already examples of this, like that TMA example is one of those, right, where it's a bacterial gene. We don't carry th this, this gene, right, but its product converts a metabolite into something that causes atherosclerosis. So you can now tar target that gene. Yeah, I mean, I have to say that we at Calliope are also unraveling some very interesting circuits um, just within the gut. And so I'm very optimistic as well that um, we're going to see some very cool circuits between the microbiome, the ENS, the gut, and the other organs that are really going to propel the field in the not too distant future. Um, let's take a few more questions here. I, yeah, I think um, I'm Fred Nazem. I'm a venture capitalist, and I have two questions. One is, and the literature refers to, they refer to uh, uh, microbiome as a second brain, basically. How true is that? And do we know the mechanism of action of that brain work? And do we know much about that relationship? And the second question I have is like, like in genetics, epigenetics has become so important in, t in the expression of the genes, not the genes themselves. Is there a similar thing for microbiome in the expression of these bugs as opposed to the bugs themselves? Sarkis, you want to take the second brain one? <laughs> I, I would say the ENS is the second brain, not, yeah. the, not the microbiome, <laughs> right? Again, the microbiome may be a second genome, right? But, but we do have a rich enteric nervous system that, that Calliope is, 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 is mapping, and we know very little about, you know, right? But if once we ha once we know what that what that landscape looks like, then we can see how the microbiome how the microbiome affects that. So, so to me, that's sort of the, you know, the second brain. If, well, you know, my gut feeling is that that's the second brain. <laughs> <laughs> and the epigenetics question. Somebody want to take that one? Uh, no. no? <laughs> Well, well, okay, I mean, just superficially, there are examples of epigenetic modifications in bacteria. It, it's just a really unexplored field. Okay. Two more questions. Yep. Are there any stable oh. viral residents in the microbiome? 
stable viral residents in the microbiome? Uh, I'll, I guess I'll start. Uh, I, I conveniently ignore viruses and, and, and archaea and, 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 and fungi and, and, and pro protists, right? But they're all part of our microbiomes, right? And bacteria dominate. We know that, right? But there are many, many mammalian viruses that a, have direct effects on the host and have effects on the microbiome, right? And there's, again, you know, it, it's a newer area than studying bacteria, and it requires the technology, you know, like metagenomics to, to do that. But it's really an emerging field, and I think we're already seeing lots of examples of particular viruses that do impact the disease process, right? And so, you know, I, I don't think we want to give people the, exam, you know, the, the impression that, that it's all bacteria. In fact, there may be other organisms that are just as important as, 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 as bacteria. Yeah. And of course, there are phage uh, viruses that are enormous in their uh, in their uh, variety and their uh, their numbers, and they clearly uh, affect the the rest of the microbiome. So my guess is that that's going to be even more important than the uh, eukaryotic viruses that are present. Last question here. Hi. Uh, thanks. I was just curious, what's the status of opinion on uh, fat? content of a person as it relates to the microbiome. I remember the early stories I heard about the leptin mice, which controlled the fat content of the mice, and the fecal transplant from fat to skinny mice made the skinnier mice fat. And I just wonder, it's not a story I've heard much about anymore, and I, it always made sense to me that, you know, the bacteria know when they want to feed, and they might be able to tell us that it may be time to feed, and over time we sort of progress into kind of an obese microbiome that's demanding more and puts pressure on the mammalian system and ultimately results in obesity and that maybe the microbiomics would be a really good way to control the fat state of humans. And I just wondered what your thoughts were on that or what the current state of research is because I have not kept up with that. Yeah, I'd, I'd call it, it's an interesting hypothesis. There certainly were germ-free experiments where, where some portion of that phenotype could be transferred, um, but uh, I, that's, a, that's an open question and a vista for future research. Yeah, and it, and it is, I've never actually thought about it, but yeah, it, it has, the, the research has not progressed, right, in, in that area. I think it made a huge splash, and it might be why we're, we're even sitting here, right, is, right. is, you know, stories like that, right, but, but we want to see more mechanism, right, we want to see, you know, how that initial discovery can lead to an actionable event, right, but for reasons I, I don't know, right, that, that line of research just hasn't progressed. Um, but just one, one thought is it goes beyond just extracting calories from, from, from diet, right? So we know that different microbiomes will affect the, the feeding behavior of animals as well. So there, there's this, you know, sort of this neurological component, if you will, um, in terms of, of the animal knowing that it's satiated versus, versus hungry. Um, but again, you know, these are, you know, you know data points or, 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 or dots that just haven't been connected yet. I, I agree. I think that's always been a really attractive explanation to me is that it's kind of encouraging you to feed and you eat more and you, you ultimately gain weight. And I've asked people in the microbiome field over a number of years, would you take an antibiotic before you started a diet? And they all sort of chuckle, look at me, and don't give me much of an answer. So I'd like to challenge you with that question. Well, there, there's evidence that, uh, that uh, after dieting, of course, there is often a very rapid rebound. And at least in animal models, uh, Elenov's group has shown that that uh, is in large part due to the, uh, the presence of the microbiome that is a, basically an obesity-associated microbiome there. So I would say, you know, taking an antibiotic is not necessarily going to deal with that because you don't know what's going to come back. Uh, you want to be able to understand what kind of microbiome you need to have uh, to, to then maintain uh, a more healthy microbiome afterwards. And, and also, um, in the... Uh, in the cattle industry for, for decades now, antibiotics have been used to make animals gain weight. Actually, a lot of the antibiotic use in, in that industry is not to prevent infections. It's actually to get the animals to, to gain weight faster. I'd be, we don't have time to go into it, but I'd be very curious if any of you have changed your own dietary habits as a result of all you know about the microbiome. But um, that's a topic for another day. And we also didn't get into diagnostics, consumer. So I think um, how often do we have a brand new area of biology like this that we can really dig into that has um, so much potential for an understanding of physiology and potentially uh, impacts on human health. So I, I'm very excited about the work of this field. And um, it's going to be really fun to see how it progresses over the next um, 
several years. So thanks to our amazing panelists uh, for their contributions today. Thank you.